All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Helen Chen, um, and I'm part of the ABLE uh, you know, 22 program committee. Really delighted to have you with us today. Um, again, this is ePortfolios 101, getting started with ePortfolios. What we really want to do is to give folks who might be new to ABLE, new to ePortfolios, an opportunity to ask questions, particularly if there are any, there's anything that uh, your ear to kind of um, get a better handle on. I do have a few slides prepared and everything which I can go go over, but really just really want to open it up for questions. So any questions you might have, if you'd like to pop those into the chat, um, but or I can go over my presentation first and then again um, invite sort of any specific questions or you know concerns, issues, or you know who's doing what in the field of X, Y, or Z. Do you know of any institutions who might be using portfolios for this purpose? Happy to sort of um, cover any of those questions that you might have. Um, in my work outside of ABLE, I'm a research scientist in the Designing Education Lab, which is in the Department of Mechanical Engineering uh, at Stanford University. I, in addition, I work closely with my colleagues in the Integrative Learning Portfolio Lab, which is housed in Stanford Career Education. My work in ePortfolios has spanned since you know the early 2000s, so there's a lot of been a, a lot of growth and change, you know, evolution. Um, I think if you would ask me then if I thought portfolios would still be a thing, I might have said no. Uh, that it might have just been another ed tech fad, but there is still something about this model, this framework of ePortfolios that really continues to resonate, you know, on multi multiple fronts, you know, from assessment to pedagogy to the technology, which we've seen so much change in. And then now in increasingly this idea of professional digital presence as another way to communicate, um, you know, and help students um, as well as, you know, faculty staff you know, tell the story and communicate what they know and what they can do. Okay, so let me go ahead and start off with a few slides. Again, you know, as questions come to you, please feel free to uh, to pop those into the chat. And I will open this up to uh, more discussion and questions, um, you know, once I complete, it, once I finish here. All right, so getting started with ePortfolios. Now, Again, this idea of a portfolio, um, a purposeful selection of artifacts together with reflections that represent some aspect of the owner's learning. Now, when we talk about artifacts, certainly any kind of evidence, evidence of work, whether it's, you know, let's say essays or um, videos or photos, um, you know, uh, examples, writing samples, other exam projects, and so on, examples of work. The owner of the portfolio. Uh, in this context, we often talk about students, um, and we have, of course, our student panel today and so on. But of course, the owner can also be faculty member for promotion and tenure portfolios, a staff member, really anyone, you know, any sort of learner who's looking to represent um, their experiences. Now, what sets a portfolio apart from something like just having, let's say, a box folder or a Google Drive, you know, with a bunch of, you know, artifacts, PDFs and so on, are the reflections. And that's where sort of the narrative uh, comes in. Now, again, when we talk about different portfolio um, platforms, certainly the choice of the platform and technology can influence you know, how the portfolio, you know, sort of the format of the portfolio, whether it's in the more narrative format or, you know, some kind of repository with lots of, you know, with these different artifacts. You know, portfolios, of course, have a long history in art, architecture, teacher education, and so on. Um, then we moved to e-portfolios, uh, certainly in the early 2000s. At that time, it was very much the E standing for electronic. Um, now, now, perhaps, you know, as you know, that's sort of just assumed, it's sort of back in terms of the language talking about just, you know, portfolios, a portfolio approach. Now, the concept of building this culture of folio thinking really references this idea of providing structured opportunities for students to not only create those learning portfolios, but also reflect on those experiences, really emphasizing the integrative learning, the synthesis, the self-understanding. That it's not just like, here's a portfolio and there you have it, but really how do you build this culture of reflective practice? And I'll go more into that uh, shortly. Now, again, I mentioned this idea of like, you know, in the early 2000s, it was very much focused on the E being electronic portfolios. And my uh, colleague, Ashley Kehoe, who was formerly at Dartmouth College, she wrote this great piece um, and, uh, you know, that she posted on LinkedIn about really redefining what the E might stand for. 
In this case, talking about experience, you know, evidence, which I think has always been a part of, you know, traditional portfolios, um, as well as engagement, an opportunity for not only the students to better engage with those experiences, reflect on those experiences, but also engagement with whoever might be reading the portfolio. Now, a commitment to excellence, when you think about a curated e-portfolio that we're still collecting out the best pieces of work and everything, that certainly remains true in some cases, although we also talk about, you know, this idea of a learning portfolio, a learning versus, let's say, more the showcase portfolio. And the differentiation there is really around who the audience is. When you think about a portfolio that a student might create as part of their journey throughout a program, a major, um, you know, an institution, then there might be opportunities for reflection to bring in pieces of work that are not sort of intended for the outside audience and so on. And certainly this idea that a student or individual could have both the learning portfolio as well as the showcase portfolio that, you know, that you're selecting pieces of work or artifacts from a learning portfolio that you might then include in a showcase. Now, sometimes this is challenging, right? Because we say to students, hey, you know, you're going to create this portfolio and you can share it with future employers. Well, sometimes that's a little bit, you know, there's a kind of a discrepancy there. You know, like, does the employer really want to see everything you've ever accomplished, everything that you did, like, let's say your freshman year, you know, English 101 essay? Not necessarily. And that's where certainly the curation comes in, that depending on who the audience is, you're going to select relevant artifacts that could represent you know, that audience as well as that purpose. Now, one thing that I think portfolios still continue to resonate is this idea of that we really want to empower our learners to be able to tell their story, to communicate what they know and what they can do. And then increasingly the opportunities for e-portfolios, and again, related to the theme of our conference around issues of equity. And I think where I've been thinking about that, you know, is really thinking about, you know, um, different kinds of identities, you know, which parts of your identity do you want to make public, you know, and also who gets to be able to say, like, you know, this is who I am, these are my experiences, and, you know, and again, you know, I stand by them, versus the student who has, you know, in thinking about these public-facing, external-facing portfolios, um, needing to be more, uh, you know, more cognizant or more aware about, you know, especially for job-seeking purposes, that um, putting things out there, what are the implications? And this relates to implicit bias and relates to hiring or relates to some of those other considerations. And I think we're starting to see more people and more, especially in career services, really thinking more about that and how do we work with students around that? Um, an idea that I've been thinking about a lot is the privilege of being authentic in the online space. You know, what parts of your identity, you know, do you want to share and what parts of your identity do you not want to share? By no means is it that you have to, you, you know, again, the privilege of who gets to come as I am or, you know, this is who I am, take it or leave it versus, you know, putting parts of your identity out there, um, you know, at this time and, you know, how that might grow and develop over time. All right. So as we think about portfolios and implementing e-portfolios, uh, Tracy's here with us and Tracy and I worked on this e-portfolio implementation framework with our colleague, John Idelson, who's a professor emeritus at Cal State Monterey Bay. And these are the six sort of um, general kind of issues or topics that we had identified. The first being identifying what are your learning outcomes or goals? You know, what's the purpose of the portfolio initiative? What are you hoping your students will get out of it, your faculty will get out of it, staff and so on? Um, and then really identifying and understanding both the learners who you're designing for as well as the stakeholders. And I think this idea of understanding your learners, really we draw upon the work of um, the principles of design thinking um, and working with colleagues in the Stanford D School. Um, for me, it really begins with empathy for who you're designing for. Many of us as faculty and staff, we're designing a portfolio initiative you know, that we want our students to participate in. Well, what do we need to know about our students to, be able to frame this in such a way that they have buy-in and they have engagement. And again, today's student panel certainly provided some insights into what they found valuable, what was important to them, and then how do we again design this experience so that it supports and resonates with them. Once we understand those learning outcomes, you know, thinking about the 
different kinds of learning activities. For example, the prompts, the activities, the exercises that then produces the artifact that would go into the portfolio. Um, certainly assessment remains a, a very strong interest in you know, the e-portfolio scholarship and as well as e-portfolio practice. Uh, yes, Mary Kay, definitely can share the slides. Um, so, you know, that I think remains important. And again, whether it's assessment, um, you know, for purposes of accreditation or assessment as an individual student assessment, it really runs the, the full range. Portfolio tools and technologies have evolved quite a bit. Um, and I'll kind of just touch briefly on that, but also happy to have a longer conversation about what are the different kind of tools and technologies that are out there. And then this last idea, which I think is also should be part of the planning, you know, is really what is the impact of your portfolio initiative? And that I think really what is what brings it back full circle. That, you know, even when you're planning at the beginning, you know, to envision this idea of like, okay, so it's a year from now, it's five years now, it's two years from now, I'm going to go back to my provost or my, you know, department chair, you know, and he's going to, he or she, or they are going to say like, you know, so what, what happened? You know, I've given you, I've invested in you to, for example, take part in the Institute on ePortfolios sponsored by AACNU or go to the ABLE conference and so on, you know, what's been the outcome? What's the deliverable? And what would you want to be able to tell that person? about you know, the impact of the portfolio initiative or the portfolio pilot. So I think those things are useful to think about when you're at the beginning, about what kind of evidence of impact you wanna have at the end and how do, you, how do you get there? What is that gonna look like? Is it testimonials from students? Is it you know, uh, retention, um, retention numbers? Is it um, you know, quantitative, qualitative? What kind of data would be valuable to have? All right. So when we think about learning outcomes, then obviously, you know, we all many of us are familiar with the AAC and you uh, learning essential learning outcomes of a liberal education. Um, these, I think, align with many institutional learning outcomes around, you know, critical thinking, quantitative literacy, oral written communication, integrative learning. And of course, this is actually a great resource because AAC and you has developed rubrics for each of these learning outcomes. And those are the value rubrics, valid assessment of learning in undergraduate education. And those are freely available on the AACNU website. By no means is it that you would take those value rubrics as is. It's certainly, they were designed, uh, intentionally designed for you know, institutions to be able to modify and adapt to align with their own institutional learning goals. Certainly they can also be aligned with you know, program learning outcomes, department learning outcomes, and so on, but there are certainly a great benchmark, you know, for looking at the kinds of criteria that may be interesting or useful to take into account. Now, increasingly, we also, in talking with various schools, there's also interest in the NACE uh, competencies for a career-ready uh, workforce. And so NACE is the National Association of Colleges and Employers. Many of our uh, colleagues in career services are part of NACE. And so on, and they have identified these particular outcomes that I they think are relevant um, based on their interactions with employers. Now you'll see some overlap, right? You know, communication skills, critical thinking skills, uh, teamwork, leadership, and so on, um, with the AACNU outcomes. So I think these this is a, another resource that you know, as we encourage our students to really take ownership and think about how they're going to communicate, again, I keep going back to this, what they know and they, what they can do to employers and what are also, what are employers looking for. Now, I like this slide, uh, this graphic that uh, my colleague, uh, Kevin Kelly, who's also uh, presenting at the conference and is a part of the ABLE program committee that he created in 2009. And the reason I like this one is this idea of, you can start with these outcomes. So let's say you take something like, you know, oral or written communication at um, this sort of system or national level. Well, what is that? What does oral and written communication look at for look like, for example, at Siena College? I know we have uh, Mary Kay with us. Okay, so what does that look like for your particular institution? Then, what does oral and written communication look like in, let's say, your School of Humanities and Sciences or the School of Engineering at the college level? And then how do you operationalize it to a departmental level in mechanical engineering, let's say, where I sit, you know, down to the individual course that an individual faculty member might be teaching. And then, you know, the actual assignment that produces the artifact 
that we're now going to hold them and say, this is an example of oral communication. Now, in this situation, you know, this is where we kind of this sort of idea in thinking about how these, you know, high level, let's say, outcomes are then operationalized, you know, to produce the artifact that is the example. This, you know, often fits into, you know, sort of uh, assessment, you know, initiatives and so on that, you know, we have these examples of student work of oral communication, and we're going to sample them across different classes or different departments, you know, to demonstrate, you know, as an institution or as a program, where are we, you know, what level of competency do we want our students to have in oral communication, you know, by the time that they graduate, or in the case of, you know, sometimes with, uh, you know, I work with, uh, have worked on some, you know, accrediting teams with um, the Western Association of Schools and Colleges, WASC, our regional accreditor and everything, you know, they may want to have certain standards or benchmarks, you know, where might someone might be as a freshman and where they might be at the time of graduation. Now, I think this is important to understand, again, what are those outcomes, whether it's outcomes for a particular course or, you know, a department or a program, as well as an institution, but then also understand that e-portfolios themselves also come with their own learning outcomes. And so my colleague, Janae Cohn, who's now the Director of Academic Technology at um, Sacramento State, uh, you know, identified these outcomes that are associated with e-portfolios, content creation, metacognition reflection, which we've been hearing, uh, you know, hearing about, you know, audience awareness, um, self-advocacy, creativity, the ability to compose in multiple media and genres, and then synthesis and analysis. I think um, those certainly very much relate to integrative learning. So when we think about this then, you know, how, how do the, all of these things align? So on one hand, what you see on the left-hand side, those institutional or program learning outcomes, um, you know, on the right-hand uh, column, class individual course learning outcomes, and then in the center, the idea of e-portfolios. So understanding that we introduce, when we introduce e-portfolios, it's not just like, okay, hey, we're gonna throw this in and now isn't it great, you're gonna be creating an e-portfolio, but the idea that with those kinds of you know, outcomes and skills, how do these all fit together? How do we map these different outcomes to ensure that you know, by introducing e-portfolios, it is really facilitating and supporting the achievement of both the learning, the institutional program learning outcomes, as well as the individual course learning outcomes. I'm going to go ahead and pause there to see if there are any questions at this time. And again, you can go ahead and unmute and pop those into the chat or, um, or, or pop them into the chat, whichever you prefer. Any questions? Okay. All right. So if there isn't, I'll go ahead and keep on going. And again, but if questions, they, if they do occur to you, uh, please go ahead and put them into the chat. And of course, we'll have time at the end as well. All right. Now, in you know, as I've been working with portfolios uh, through these years, um, you know, if there is, it's it's my belief or my opinion, really, that if there is a theoretical framework for portfolios, it's going to be integrative learning. And this particular piece by uh, Mary Taylor Huber and Pat Hutchings, who used to be at the Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching, really, I think, is a foundational piece for really thinking about what is integrative learning. Um, here, they define it as an understanding and disposition that a student builds across the curriculum and the co-curriculum, from making simple connections among ideas and experiences to synthesizing and transferring learning to new complex situations within and beyond the campus. The idea of transfer of learning, I think, is yet another sort of, um, you know, framework that we can, and body of literature that we can, you know, sort of build upon from learning sciences. So John Bransford had written this, uh, you know, really foundational book on, you know, how people learn. And so I think, again, another sort of theoretical framework, you know, or model would be the idea of learning transfer. Now, AACNU does actually have this rubric, the value rubric on integrative learning. And here are some of those dimensions or criteria, connections to experience, 
again, transfer, and then reflection and self-assessment. So uh, you can see that reflective practice is not only a critical component of e-portfolios, but actually of all high impact practices. And, you know, as we're trying to do with, you know, folio thinking is providing students with those structured opportunities to encourage them and support them in making those connections. So what I'd like to do now is actually kind of talk about these different sort of levels of implementation, you know, for e-portfolios. And so Jessica Chittam, uh, who works in, um, who, who works at AACNU, she and I developed this as part of uh, the AACNU Institute on General Education and Assessment. And so what I'll go through is like give an example of each, again, an institutional portfolio that would follow a student across all of their experiences uh, during their time at an institution, whether it's a two-year or four-year or you know, even grad career. Um, a program or departmental portfolio, that would be, you know, again, in, the, in particular program, department, or major. The individual course portfolio that an individual faculty member might be introducing. Um, a portfolio that is just simply an assignment or project. And this, I, I think, is something to, you know, kind of keep in mind, especially if you might be thinking about entry points for getting started, you know, that we often talk about scaling up. Oh, how do we get every, every student in our program to build a portfolio, every student in, you know, um, in gen ed to develop a portfolio. But the opportunity, if you're, let's say, an individual faculty member um, or staff member looking to just pilot this, you know, think about what's within your control. It doesn't even necessarily have to be that I'm going to use portfolios through my, throughout my entire course, but the idea that is there an existing project where a portfolio approach might be helpful? You know, for example, let's say a group project where a portfolio, where, you know, students could create a portfolio instead of just turning in another group report. Um, and then the last in green is this idea of professional uh, digital presence, the individual uh, student portfolio that is really external facing, you know, intended for external audiences, whether let's say it be, you know, another academic institution, graduate school, or uh, often most commonly uh, employer or even alumni audiences. Okay. So let me see here. Okay, so at the institutional level, then a portfolio that follows the student across the educational experiences at an institution. So when I first started thinking about portfolios, um, you know, at Stanford, I had created this um, this map, and this is actually you know what I would now call a journey map. And I would like to also highlight that tomorrow morning we have um, two. Uh, two sessions where two different institutions have used journey maps as part of their portfolio planning process. So we encourage you to kind of check that out. But this idea of thinking about the career, the, the journey map or the undergraduate career of you know, students. So again, you know, if we're taking a student-centered, learner-centered approach to thinking about where portfolios could be a good fit, Everything here in the white boxes represents that kind of traditional academic journey of the student of you know the students. You know, they come into Stanford, they get assigned a pre-major advisor, they take their gen ed courses, introductory seminars, eventually they declare a major, they have a major advisor, they take their major courses, maybe they study abroad or do research and do some kind of capstone honors thesis. These are all the things that get traditionally captured on an academic transcript. But then when we think about who else, you know, is part of that that sort of academic journey? Um, what else are they involved in? Whether it's extracurricular, or co-curricular activities, involvement in clubs and organizations, residential education, community public service. That you know, as you know, they're thinking about summer internships, other um, you know activities, and so on. Think about what they want to do in the future. Now, in thinking about where portfolios might. It, then, you know, initially I thought, okay, well, you know, academic advising, that seems an obvious place, but, you know, I didn't want e-portfolios to just be a one-off that they get either in a first year experience or, you know, um, in academic advising. So then the question is then along this learning journey, you know, where this learning career, where are students already having to reflect? You know, when are they having to think about, okay, what do I want to major in? What am I going to do this summer? You know, do I want to get involved in research? What do I want to do? What do I want to do with my life? And so trying to under, you know, identify those milestones for reflection that are already happening, that could be opportunities for a portfolio to fit in. Now, with that in mind, then, then it was like, well, who are they talking to? 
you know? And so this next slide actually represents, you know, what I describe as the constellation of stakeholders. So in the center is this idea, if we have a portfolio and it includes artifacts and evidence and so on, who would be interested in looking at that? Who does that benefit? Of course, we hope that that will benefit the student because I think throughout all of these things is that we really do want this to be of value to the students, that it's not, you know, here, do this portfolio, you submit it and it disappears off into the ether and everything, but how can components of the portfolio actually be helpful and useful to the students themselves such that they can take greater ownership of it or they identify pieces that they would want to incorporate in other aspects of, you know, their um the record that they complete for themselves. Now, in terms of thinking about these stakeholders, of course, I mentioned like I work closely with my colleagues in career services. You know, we have um, academic advising because they're already having these kinds of conversations with students. How do we move it away from being like a transactional sort of conversation to something that's more transformative um, and developmental? Um, some interesting stakeholders that have found uh, that we've been able to engage with over the years, alumni. Alumni, of course, are invested in current in the success of the current students, invested in the institution. The idea of e-portfolios opens up opportunities to engage alumni who may not be within the geographic proximity of your institutions. And one thing I will say in the undergraduate portfolio course that I teach um, you know, in, in our program in writing and rhetoric, you know, we moved our showcases, our showcase events, you know, online during COVID um, and during remote teaching. And actually we've kept them that way because it allows us to bring in people um, who normally would not have been able to come to campus and also provides a lot of flexibility for um, people to, you know, to kind of drop in, see some portfolios, get some feedback. And so we've engaged alumni from around the country, sometimes around the world, as well as employers and recruiters um, who also aren't necessarily coming to campus for on-campus job fairs and so on. So alumni, I think, actually is, has been a really um, interesting resource that we've been able to tap into. The other sort of stakeholder I just want to point out that's maybe sort of a little bit may not necessarily come immediately to mind is actually our registrar, you know, and this actually goes with thinking about what is the official record of the institute, you know, that a, a student's education when they graduate. And on one hand, you know, when they graduate, they leave campus, they leave campus with a diploma, which they might put in a frame and hang on the wall, you know, or something like that. But it's the academic transcript. Now, when you think about the academic, traditional academic transcript, a traditional sort of a chronological listing of courses with inscrutable course titles that no one really understands outside of academia, and you're only get it on your way out of the institution so you can just send it to somebody else. Well, even though that's the official record, think about all the things that aren't on the academic transcript. And that includes things like high impact practices that or innovations in pedagogy that all of you may be engaged in and so on, but are not part of that official record. At the same time, increasingly we see students who are now, you know, once they graduate, they're creating their own records. How do they represent themselves? You know, whether it's, you know, typically these days, lots of course through LinkedIn, and certainly I get asked the question, perhaps you as well, you know, can LinkedIn be my e-portfolio? In many ways, it's certainly become that. Um, and LinkedIn has added features that allow for the inclusion of, you know, um, let's say like a slide deck or PDFs and things like that. I've also seen students now as part of their LinkedIn point to a personal website because in the personal website, they have much greater control about what kinds of experiences they choose to highlight. Whereas, you know, within LinkedIn and also your resume, you're more constrained by the standardized format. And of course, it's designed intentionally in that way to allow for easy sort of um, professional networking and that kind of thing. So this idea of thinking about stakeholders, knowing that there's no way that any one of us can do this by ourselves, and everything, you know, who else can you potentially partner with and who else would be interested if students are indeed creating these portfolios? All right, so the next is sort of a, at a program or a departmental level. Um, you know, the example I have here is actually from IUPUI and there are philanthropic uh, studies where they have a capstone uh, portfolio. Um, and actually I can just try to bring it up uh, right here. Uh, okay. 
So uh, just to kind of give you an idea of you know what they're doing. So they have this capstone portfolio um, that I'm not seeing right here, but um, but certainly is this idea of like you know having students be able to represent the experiences that they have you know during their uh, bachelor's you know program. All right. So at a course level, this is probably perhaps you know um, you know where individual faculty and staff. Uh, lecturers can, you know, have the greatest control in thinking about how a portfolio can represent a course experience. And we saw with several of the students, uh, Debbie H. Minor from IUPI this morning, talking about how the portfolio, you know, fit within the course experience. And again, the, how the portfolio aligned with those, you know, course learning outcomes. And then at the assignment or project level, and I find this actually to be the most interesting, that a portfolio that's developed as a standalone assignment or project or experience, such as a capstone or honors thesis, that here, you know, with these examples, these are examples of existing projects or, you know, assignments, that could those employ a portfolio approach or a portfolio pedagogy, whether it's something like a lab notebook, you know, where students are documenting and recording and so on, a policy brief or a field notebook and so on. So really encouraging faculty to consider, are there any existing assignments where a portfolio approach could be helpful? And that's a very kind of easy way to think about experiment with, start experimenting with uh, portfolio pedagogy and portfolio approaches. Now, I mentioned this idea of integrated learning and this particular quotation from Rebecca Noasek about how we empower our students to be agents of integration, individuals who are actively working to perceive the connections they make and how to convey them effectively to others. I mean, ultimately, I think this is the aspiration, you know, that we want them to not just say, you know, I checked, you know, I'm, it's the checklist of courses or the checklist of gen ed requirements that I'm just checking them and that I'm done. Or when they enter a particular major or program, they're really thinking about how the class that they took last quarter or last semester relates to the class that they're doing at, that there's this accumulation of knowledge and integration of that knowledge and experience. So when I think about this idea of a portfolio that is intended for, in, you know, to develop one's individual or digital presence, that, you know, that is really focused on those personal values or professional goals, thinking about, you know, careers, thinking about external audiences, whether it's, again, grad school or, you know, another institution to transfer to, or perhaps um, this idea of, of employers and so on. And thinking about in this model, the integration of folio thinking, storytelling approaches, and again, thinking about digital presence, which may relate to things around, you know, social media and so on. So here then, I just do I want to mention this work from uh, AACNU about what employers value and they value applied experiences, you know, and of course internships specifically, but also this idea of a portfolio of work that might showcase skills in integrating uh, college experiences. And this is one of their national surveys of employers and hiring managers. And these I think represent all of the, uh, the high impact practices. So this, I think, within this broader context of the pandemic, you know, recognizing how, you know, even how hiring takes place and networking in the professional context has evolved. Um, the emphasis on, you know, more professionals have begun to create personal websites and curate a social media presence to really convey some of what resumes once did. And an exercise that we often engage in with our students is to Google, if not yourself, but Google the person next to you and see what, come, what comes to the top and what's the story that is emerging as a result of that. And also what's the story you do, you want to be told, you know, about who you are and um, your, you know, digital identity. So when we talk about e-portfolios then, you know, to students um, in this particular sort of framework, you know, so what does an e-portfolio reveal about you that other profiles and records do not, you know, so the opportunity to provide, allow the students, and this is the empowerment side, to tell a consistent story and a holistic message about who they are, give them more control and ownership, be able to provide some of that context and background and really allow them to differentiate themselves from other platforms that may focus on standardization. 
And a key component of this, of course, is evidence, you know, that the evidence that they use to represent their story. Examples of artifacts might be posters, presentations, research papers, uh, thought leadership, such as blogs or um, other kinds of posts, testimonials. And then these may take different formats, pictures and images, videos, text, and so on, other kinds of documents and so on. Within, of course, the digital space, it is a lot of e emphasis on the multimedia aspects and so on. And so some, that's where some of the digital literacy you know, considerations come in. Now, an example of a, of a portfolio um, from a student who took my, who is just finished his first year and is a student who took my course um, last winter. So here, Peter, you know, a self-motivated programmer who uses technical knowledge to support others. You know, the idea of how we're seeing transfer being, you know, communicated, you know, the skills learned and used in work and how he's making connections. I think this might have been uh, Squarespace, actually. And so, um, you know, so he volunteered at the Stanford Office of Accessible Education. He worked at Target when he was in high school. He was a soccer referee and then also volunteered in one of our, you know, community centers. One thing I am starting to see, and I think, you know, I think this is very interesting is that, you know, in his about me, you know, he's able to include things about his, you know, his background that probably is not so easy to communicate in a LinkedIn profile that he's a first generation student at Stanford. Uh, his parents immigrated um, from Guatemala and El Salvador. His mom works as a nanny. His father is a sanitation worker. Now, again, you know, the conversations we have with students is not to say, include this, don't include that. Or, you know, again, which parts of your identity do you want to share? You know, and but it's, you know, the opportunities to have those conversations and also help educate them about the potential implications, whether it's implicit bias, you know, whether it's, you know, possible, you know, discrimination. Um, you know, working with uh, one of our student workers is actually, um, you know, gave a workshop to our Muslim community. Um, she herself uh, uh, wears a hijab and this question about should she include a picture, you know, on her LinkedIn profile. Now, the statistics show that if you include a picture, your profile is more likely to be, you know, uh, clicked on. But it was something, a question that she had. And so, again, there are opportunities to have these conversations to help students make informed decisions about what choices they want to make, again, about what they want to share and what they may not. And again, a lot of it is a, is a personal decision. But, you know, again, having these conversations about uh, what are those potential implications. Um, another example here, and this actually kind of models sort of one thing that, you know, we are increasingly seeing. Um, so Caitlin was a master's student in uh, product design and mechanical engineering. You know, so students who have lots of different kinds of experiences and so on, um, you know, how to present them in a way, in a, in a concise way that actually isn't overwhelming. So here, what we're starting to see is students using almost like a little template, you know, objective impact, in this case, hard skills, soft skills, you know, for a list of a curated list of, let's say, a collection of about five to 10, you know, experiences and so on. And this kind of framework or template actually allows the reader to more effect, more easily begin to kind of process and be able to understand, you know, what is, um, you know, how to look at these experiences across. So, and also help if part of a reflective process on the part of the students to be able to identify those skills uh, and competencies for themselves. All right, so, you know, in summary then, um, before I open it up for your questions and, um, and, you know, topics that you might like to explore, um, I borrowed this from our, my colleagues in the D School. You know, what if our students were to declare a mission and not a major? You know, so many of our students, they, when they introduce themselves, you know, during college, it's like, hi, you know, my name is Helen Chen, I'm majoring in mechanical engineering and so on, which is a noun. But, you know, if we encourage them to think about what's their mission, what they want to accomplish, like, you know, talking with students recently, I want to help people. Well, there's so many different ways you can do that, whether you want to go through the path of medicine or engineering or the humanities and so on. Um, it really kind of broadens the conversation and also encourages them to think about Again, what are those transferable knowledge and experiences and skills that they will take away from their undergraduate or graduate experience into sort of whatever their plans might be in the future? 
All right. So that was just a, you know, firehose overview of some of the basics of ePortfolios. I'm going to go in and put my contact information into the, uh, into the chat. And again, we we'll really welcome your uh, questions, um, anything that you're interested in asking about. And maybe before I do that, uh, I'll ask Tracy to see if she has any sort of anything to add, um, you know, <laughs> for this ePortfolios 101 session. No, I think that was a fantastic overview, Helen, and um, hopefully it gave everyone some food for thought. And, and you know, I think the one thing is, uh, even for me, having worked with ePortfolios for a long time, I always refer, re, you know, refer back to the implementation framework as I'm beginning to develop an implementation initiative just to make sure that, you know, I am thinking through all of the various pieces that, that we need to consider because even... Um, for those of us who are seasoned, sometimes you can get, you know, excited about, you know, the activities or the outcomes and uh, forget to really think about evaluation or or mm -hmm. the other pieces. And then I think I'm not sure I had to step away for a moment, whether you talked about um, digital ethics related to this, but that's that's the other piece I would add mm -hmm. um, if you haven't already is just, you know, thinking about the work that the digital ethics task force has, has done at ABLE and leveraging that into our thinking, I think is, is really important, especially in this time when we're trying to think about equity, inclusivity, et cetera. Yes. Yes. So I did not talk about that, uh, but you're absolutely right, Tracy. I mean, I think the work of our digital ethics task force has been, you know, tremendous and um, it has been increasingly important. I think, especially with respect to the principle, one of the, my favorite principles of theirs, of course, is the principle of labor. You know, who's doing this work, who's getting compensated and recognized for this and, you know, how can we more intentionally and proactively address that? Yeah, and and adding to that, what kind of work are we asking our students to do? You know, mm -hmm. you know, we we always advocate that you, um, uh, you know, that you really think about how you integrate this really tightly into the other things that the students doing. So it's not an add on, um, mm -hmm. but but rather something that that is is part of of the program or the course or whatever the learning experience that they're being engaged in. So it, it's both about what kind of labor are we engaged in and then what kind of labor are we asking the students to engage in. I, wow. you know, I'm at a school in um, the Caribbean and most of my student, my I'm teaching a uh, master of education program, most of our students are um, you know, students who are non-traditional in the sense that they might be teachers um, or educators, but haven't necessarily had formal teacher training. And so when we get them into our program, they're also working full time. They also have families there, you know, so really thinking about how we've tightly woven the ePortfolio work into what they're doing um, already is, is so important because it's it's just so we get so excited about all the, the things that we're teaching that it's easy mm -hmm. to um, pile it on and uh, our yeah. students are always reminding us mm, this is taking you know x number of hours and I think the other thing is you know thinking through how long realistically will it take um, mm -hmm. our students these various tasks, you know, for me, I'm not really technologically oriented. So it takes me, as Helen can attest to, much longer to do something <laughs> in WordPress um, than it might take um, someone else. And so I think kind of thinking about those skills that they already have, if mm -hmm. they don't already have them, how do we build that in? And again, it's designing with the learner in mind, starting with them to find mm -hmm. out what they know, understand and are able to do, and then and then creating an experience that is really going to give them something new to do rather than, you know, either have them do something that they feel like they've already learned to do um, or that's not meaningful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Exactly, exactly.